Hi, everyone. We're so excited to welcome you to our next webinar, State of Performance Enablement from AI to Stellar Employee Experience. During this webinar, you'll be hearing from industry leaders Susan Lovegren, Ben Eubanks, and Andrew Roundtree, as well as members of the BetterWorks team. Before we get started, we'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate in today's event. This webinar is being recorded, and all attendees will receive the recording post-event. All attendees are in view-only mode, please submit any questions for our presenters in the ask a question box below the slide screen. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation and the speakers will address them in the Q&A portion of the event. If you run into any technical issues, please submit your question in the ask a question box as well and our producer will help you troubleshoot. Please also notice the clipboard widget in the far right of the dock. That's our feedback survey. If you could please take a moment to complete the survey before leaving the platform, We'd greatly appreciate it as this helps us shape future webinars. Before I hand it over to our moderator, I'd like to share a few more things. As part of our webinar today, the State of Performance Enablement Report is available in the related content section of the console. It's filled with key findings around what employees and managers want from performance management and what they can expect of their organizations. Be sure to download your copy. Stay tuned for details on our next webinar in our People Fundamentals series with Polly Labar on August 24th invites coming soon. And lastly, we're excited to share that our CEO, Doug Dennerline and VP of HR Transformation, Jamie Aitken, have written a book called Make Work Better, Revolutionizing How Great Bosses Lead, Get Feedback, and Empower Employees. You can learn more at makeworkbetter.com. Now, without further ado, I'd like to hand over uh, the presentation to our moderator, John Schneider, CMO of BetterWorks. John, over to you. Thank you, Alex. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover today, so we're gonna go a little bit fast in the introduction here, but uh, you've heard me say it several times, everything to do with BetterWorks in our webinar series, we believe in people fundamentals. Um, we believe that there's this natural state of all of us at work in, in a situation where we all are able to strive and achieve, that we are able to bring out our creativity, that we feel valued and recognized for our contributions. We call these people fundamentals, and we believe that strategic HR leaders, such as all of you on this call, translate these into business fundamentals that really help organizations achieve. And that really gets us to today and what we're trying to do with this webinar today. Uh, with so much change afoot for you as HR practitioners, we thought it is an ideal time to do a little bit of a reflection and look at some trends and patterns in the workforce right now. It's hard to believe, but we are already past the midpoint of the calendar year. That kind of scares me personally. Um, but with, with what's been going on in recent uh, months, just like it has for the last few years, it feels like there's just constant need for adaptation and change in the workforce. You know, it's hard to believe that generative AI wasn't even a topic before last fall for the most part. Um, and there's a whole new wave of disruptions around threats around inflation, slowing economy in some sectors yet, uh, labor shortages in others. And to make sense of all that and for various industries and, and workforces to adapt to them, it is rather a challenge. Um, with People Fundamentals webinars, as always, and, and all our webinars, you know, we, we, we strive to you know, get HR, IC credits, insurance credits out. Um, we want them to be educational. Please make sure you ask questions in the in the discuss the Q and A section. I will be handpicking as many of them as I can and bringing the live in here so we can all learn from each other's questions. Briefly, you heard about the panel that we have today. Uh, ben Eubanks is the chief research officer at Lighthouse Research and Advisory. He's also the best-selling uh, author of Talent Scarcity, a new book out that you can get on Amazon. And you know, I mentioned that you know, generative AI wasn't really a topic before last fall, but we have Ben Eubanks who actually was writing about it. And there, he has a book on AI for HR all the way back dating 2018 that you can also get off the shelf. So uh, he's on the forefront of it and that's great because we're gonna be talking about it. Susan Lovegren, EVP, CHRO and advisory board. She's doing a lot. Um, most recently, chief, product, uh, chief people and culture officer at Medallia um, having taken it through the rapid growth stage, stage to IPO. Um, she's been at a prestigious series of Silicon Valley companies um, from AppDynamics being acquired by Cisco to Juniper Networks and Plantronics. And, and uh, Andrew Roundtree as also, he joins us as a BetterWorks customer that we love very much, Best Western International. 
He's the director of HR, and he's been striving to bring performance enablement to reality, technologically, programmatically, and everything in between. And so couldn't be a better person to round out this expert panel. Before we dive into it, I would like to just call out um, a little bit about the research we're going to ground ourselves in. The State of Performance Enablement Report is, uh, was, was written and released in 2023, and it captures the sentiment of the workforce from the lens of how well people feel enabled to perform at their best. This, this report's written for all of you, HR professionals. We do it as an independent research study. It is not about better works. It's about what the workforce is thinking, managers and employees. You can see the breakdown of, of who we go after in this. It's full-time employees. We try to get a split of managers and employees uh, in the workforce, and they all have to be full-time employed. We look at the US and the UK in it. So with that said, I'm gonna go right into this. Michelle uh, Goldsberry is one of my esteemed colleagues and actually the driver of this research project on an annual basis. She's going to give us some of this readout before we dive into the panel discussion around some of the findings in it. Great. Well, hi, John, and hello, everyone. Uh, I am going to be your tour guide as we travel through some of the main themes of the report, showing you the points of interest and drawing your attention to some really interesting data that tells a story we think will help you make sense of what's happening in your workforce. Um, there were six themes in all, and since we don't have time to cover everyone and get to the great panel discussion, we're going to focus on the ones that we think are the most eye-popping. Uh, the key takeaway of this report is the following. Employees want a fair deal from their employees. That is what arose from all the data. They want to get out of work what they put into it. And so the need to reimagine the employee deal became the overarching theme of the research. So. First question, what do we mean by a fair employee deal? Well, employees feel they've been giving their all, especially since the pandemic. They've dealt with layoffs and reassignments. They've readjusted to new ways of working and borne a lot of stress and burnout, not just from work, but from everything that's happened in the world, as we all know. But they've, and, you know, they've persevered through this. Um, they feel they've been resilient and productive but they aren't getting in return what they feel they deserve, what they've put into the system. And so this gets us to, you know, I think our first finding, right? Sorry, correct. I was getting to the mute. Yes, absolutely. We're gonna be talking about this notion of uh, fairness and trust, which is really foundational to the overall fair deal. Um, and, and it really, the report with this finding shows that we need to pay more attention to it um, there are more, uh, there are many components to the notion of fairness. It kind of permeates everything with respect to the employee experience from things like a sense of whether you feel there's bias or there's not bias in any of our, pro in any of the processes employees experience to whether or not you have a fair chance to grow and develop in your career and excel. Um, and so, you know, Michelle, I think with this one, it's, it was really good to talk about this from the standpoint of like, if you can't get to the fairness, you can't get to the fair deal. And that that um, the notion of like, you know, if there is distrust that is established in the culture, that is a steep hill to climb uh, between the employee and the employer. And it's not a place you ever want to be. Absolutely. I mean, there, there are a lot of sentiments that impact metrics like engagement and productivity. So when we ask survey participants what is important to them in their employee experience, they ranked fairness as the most important aspect. Um, 55%, and that was followed by good work culture, flexibility, growth, and a supportive team rounding out the top five. And those other four were all in the 40 to 50% uh, area. So it's reasonable to say, by definition, that fairness includes concepts of equity and trust, uh, inclusion, the absence of bias, and that delivering on these provides a better employee deal. So if we break this down a bit, for example, looking at, let's say, belonging and feeling valued, which is essentially you know, recognition and appreciation, half of employees feel valued and like they belong only some of the time, and one third feel a sense of belonging all the time. So there's some work to do. We'd like that 50% you know, number to, to, to uh, increase. Fairness also comes into play in a big way with performance reviews. So only 30% of employees say they're always fair. And that's despite that the fact that we found that between 2020 and 2022, 
46% of employees said their companies either um, changed their performance management technology or their process. So there, there's still ways to go. So let's take a look at what the impact of, on the sentiment of, um, of the sentiment of fairness, what impact that has on productivity and engagement. So um, fairness is a big topic, but the steps that organizations need to ensure a fair and psychologically safe environment are not always self-evident. However, if you're looking at this slide, you see that there's a 23% difference in productivity when performance reviews are seen as fair versus unfair. And the delta there for engagement is 14%. Um, there's also a difference in sense of belonging, which is not shown here, but it's something that I think is important to cover. Uh, if reviews are seen as completely or even partially unfair, that sense of belonging just drops. It varies from something like 10 to 30%, depending upon the degree of unfairness that, that an employee feels. But when performance reviews are seen as very fair and equitable, that sense of belonging jumps as much as 60 points to 70%. So that's a big lever. So you know, good performance enablement really does move the needle on fairness um, for organizations. Let's talk about the trust side of the equation a little bit. Fairness and trust are obviously closely related. So we notice here that there is a trust gap that employees have with organization, with organizational leaders and HR. So employees have much higher trust among their teams and their managers, 68% and 57% respectively, versus HR and leadership in the high 20s and low 30s. So HR leaders need to mind this trust gap and pull some big levers to close it. So what are those big levers? Well, this was one of the, one of the incredible um, statistics that really stood out to me when we um, looked at the research. We found that one of those big levers to change that sentiment is in fact performance management. So when employees view performance management as failed, trust just collapses. Um, if you see there, it goes down to 10 and 12% for HR leaders, 40% for direct managers. Just to give you some, some context, the baseline, in, in other words, how employees and, and uh, normally feel would be um, trust would be 41% for HR, 49% for organizational leaders, and 79% for managers. That's just normal course of things. So when, but when performance reviews are bad, we see that drop. On the other side, if delivering a fair employee experience is key, then what we see here is that performance management, when it's successful, creates a, creates a lot more trust. So trust soars by four times for HR and organization leaders, and it doubles for managers, right? 41% for HR, 49% for organizational leaders, and 79% for managers. Now, I know I'm throwing a lot of statistics at you, but I think that what's key here is the trust soars by 4x and 2x, right, depending upon your starting point. So um, if delivering that fair employee experience is key and there is a large positive effect on fairness seen with good performance management, then what are those aspects of the employee experience that performance management is touching is the question. That's, that, that's a great question, uh, Michelle. Um, you know, performance processes have such a bad reputation and, and it's due to that narrow definition that it was born out of where it's really, you know, about ratings that drive comp decisions that are about you know moderating that compensation strategy around the the business's objectives around financials and such and that it really has been an utter failure at what its actual the words are which is to help drive up the performance of the organization in, in pursuit of achieving its goals and so when we talk about you know as practitioners here what what it means to be effective with performance management it touches so many components of the employee experience and the employee life cycle. Um, you know, anywhere from you know the quality and you know one of the one of the big ones might be the quality and alignment of the manager and the employee. We know that it's the number one reason an employee will quit is having a bad manager. And if performance, if these performance processes don't establish that that fair deal, that relationship of a trusted partner between the manager and the employee. That's a good example of a, a very big topic, a very big part of HR processes that, that are, are going to fail around it. So with that next finding, we are going to zero in on, and, and much of the study was focused on this topic of how, how we can be more effective with managers. And we know they're often the most neglected audience out there. We worry about company performance, we worry about employee performance, and then what happens with managers? 
And we know there's a lot of reports around stress and burnout. One of our partners with BetterWorks is UKG, and they typified this issue with some recent research and stated 46% of middle managers say that they're likely going to quit their job um, this year due to work-related stress. I mean, 46% is just absolutely alarming, alarming when the manager is the conduit to the employee and, and their ability to achieve. Um, and, and you're just not going to get past go as a company with, with, with this kind of stat. So we want to dive in here, you know, Michelle, and talk a little bit about, you know, what's, what's underneath all of this work-related stress and, and what are we not doing for managers and what can we do better? Right. So managers, as we all know, are the conduit through which communications, company values, belonging, and growth are experienced, right? Most, empl most employees told us that they like working for their managers, either some of the time or all of the time, nine, nine out of 10. But just over half of employees, 56%, think their manager cares about their career growth, which is hopeful. But almost one of every three employees said that no one cares. So there is obviously a disconnect here on career discussions. What we discovered is that 46% of managers are in fact not confident in coaching employees for career development. The item that, by the way, is second highest on the employee's um, list of reasons why they would stay with their employer. That was second and skilling was third. So the importance of career development and skill building, by the way, moved up to like second and third place, as I just mentioned, from fifth place last year. So it has increasing importance for employees as we start getting away from all the pandemic related stuff and start getting back to kind of what we have as the new normal. So what can be done? Well, we asked uh, and managers told us that they need more help from HR. Uh, about a quarter get support um, that they need all the time. 46% get support some of the time and the rest, none of the time, unfortunately. So what, what do managers want? Well, we listed here at the bottom, their top three on their wish list uh, is coaching for performance, support with reviews, assessments, and ratings, and coaching for careers and skill development, all coming in in the 40, around 40%. So we also know, I think innately, that most people, most managers are not naturally gifted for managing and coaching. Many are elevated into management because they perform well as individual contributors. Managers, and especially those who are new or have been managers for just a short time, they have to be taught, they have to be counseled and mentored and given the resources and tools to help them be successful. Um, one of the, one of the um, research um, partners that, that we have is Red Thread Research and they've done extensive studies on this topic. And their research shows that at a time when organizational support for managers should be increasing, it's actually been declining. And this is something that Stacia Gar of Red Thread talked about during our People Fundamentals webinar in June. Uh, Stacia said that the primary focus of managers now should be on making connections with employees. There was a lot of great data in that webinar. Uh, and so I would encourage everybody to, to check it out. I think Alex is going to put a link in chat. Um, but I wanted to just share with you a few of the benefits that organizations experience with more effective managers, according to Red Threat. They include a higher net promoter score, higher innovation, and higher productivity. Employees are also more likely to stay with their organization. So, um, you know, we'll, we're going to talk more about manager effectiveness in our panel discussion. I have a lot to say on it, but um, I, hopefully that will, some of that will get covered in the discussion. And so I guess we'll move on to our final theme. Yeah, and I think we're a little behind yourself. I'm gonna go really quick on this one. So the next topic, the last one we're gonna go through is the effects of performance enablement. And we found that it has a multiplier effect on the success of an organization. Real quickly, performance enablement being a, le a lever, it, it philosophically centers on having agile goal setting and tracking, uh, frequent peer feedback, meaningful conversations between employees and managers, um, and, and recognizing that this all has to happen seamlessly in how people do work. So we call it in the flow of work. So Michelle, with that, I um, want to go pretty quickly here. So like, let's dive right into what does it mean to have okay. this multiplier effect? You know? 
I'm going to try to talk really fast. Okay, so it's a ma performance management is a big lever to pull according to the statistics. It can help managers be more effective by giving them the framework, the tools, and the templates to have meaningful performance and development conversations with employees. Um, when managers and employees have frequent conversations and specifically ones that focus on career development, employees who are always satisfied with those career and development check-ins are seven and a half times more likely to see a clear path for internal advancement. That spells retention. So that one is huge to me. And then effective performance management also reduces bias and the perception of bias, okay, getting to the fairness issue, by using peer feedback and incorporating that into performance reviews, with the results being that employees are two and a half to four times more likely to say that the reviews are unbiased. Um, and you'll see here that before I talk about performance enablement as a whole, let's go back to the managers for a second because they are a critical lever in the employee experience. Satisfaction with manager conversations around both performance and career development have an outsized impact on employee sentiment and the hard metrics of productivity and engagement that you can see on this slide. And then finally, here are some of the outcomes, moving back up to performance enablement. Here's some of the outcomes we see when employees have performance enablement that works. They feel more productive, engaged, confident, optimistic, and resilient. So those are the highlights. Again, there are many eye-popping findings, at least to me, in the report that we didn't have time to go over here. So I encourage everyone to read it if you haven't done so already and reach out to us with any questions. And now, John, I'm going to throw it back to you and our panel. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so yeah, let's let's dive right in. So welcome, Ben, uh, Susan, and Andrew uh, to the discussion. We'll see you. There we go. I think we have people popping on screen. Awesome. There's our panel. Great. We're going to go right into this. So question number one, uh, I want to throw this one at Ben. I think you have a point of view around it. But performance management is often seen as an issue to, to deal with. Um, and I know you have a, a perspective on why it should be considered a business thing, not just an issue. <laughs> um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your, your philosophy on this? Sure, absolutely. Hey, everybody. So glad to be here with you. Looking forward to sharing some, some ideas, some research through this. So to your point there, the problem here is that for many companies, and I've been an HR leader, so I've been there, I've had this responsibility. This is just a, a thing to check off. It's a performance thing. It's just an HR thing. And that's very short sighted to see it that way. Ultimately, this is really about not just that individual's performance, but this rolls up to business performance. And if we're not holding them accountable to things and measuring actions and behaviors that align to business performance, time to go back and start over and make sure we're putting those things together in the, on the front end, because that's the ultimate goal of this. Are we performing better as a company tomorrow than we did yesterday? And that only happens when we're helping to enable each of our people. I love the performance enablement focus here, because it's not just managing your performance and putting a thumb on you as an employee, but how do we bring out the very best that any of our people bring to the table, make sure they're able to show up to work capable, prepared, they have the right resources, the right leadership support, right, the right trust, all those things that have come through the conversation already today to really enable them to be their very best. The, the big thing that I see in our research that echoes some of what I've seen here today, if you've been sharing this, is that companies that have better revenue, better attention rates, better engagement scores, those high performing companies are much more likely to be weaving all of these things together, right? Recognition, development into how they manage performance. If they're a low performer, they're much more likely to say, it's just about managing performance, it's just backward looking. It's not about forward looking and helping Ben or John or anyone else here to be more capable and valuable tomorrow. That's my big perspective on that. Excellent. Andrew, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I absolutely love what Ben said. I mean, so many times throughout my career, you know, performance management is looked at as a check the box. Comes up twice a year, it's a compliance piece, we just gotta work through it. However, when you take a more whole, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> do, 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 on to the next thing. Um, but truly, employees are the biggest asset. I mean, what's gonna separate the good companies from the great companies? are those companies that have the ability to work as a cohesive team, get everybody rowing in the same direction towards a common goal. Sounds simple, but it's extremely difficult or everyone would be doing it. So companies have to work really, really hard to create a culture that fosters you know, an environment that focuses on people working together towards a common goal. And it's even harder to get them focusing on the right goal. And that's where performance management really comes in. It's these conversations that ensure 
everyone is focusing on the right things and the outcome is exactly what Ben said. You're gonna see more revenue, you're gonna see cost savings, you're gonna see retention, you know, so many great things. So, so absolutely. Excellent. Okay, well, I'm going to go on to the second question, and this is going to be a meaty one because we're going to go, and I, as I mentioned early on, all these changes in the workforce and, and how this need to adapt. And, and, we, and I mentioned generative AI, which before the fall wasn't even a real big workforce conversation. Um, you know, and, and I know there's lots of speculation. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it somewhere in between? At BetterWorks, we really see it as an opportunity to make performance management a much lighter lift for managers and employees to make it easier, to make it more effective. Um, and, and there's going to be much on that in the future. But, um, you know, I think there's a lot of consensus that the technology is going to have a major impact on how people work, right? It's going to have a fundamental change to, to our interaction in the workplace. And so this is going to be a two-part question. And Susan, I'm going to go right at you since uh, I think you have some thoughts on this. And um, first off question is, how can organizations help employees adapt and thrive amidst this change and use technology like generative AI to, to, to their advantage? Um, when there's so many things happening all at once here with this topic. Right, right. Well, first of all, I think it's um, a super exciting time to be in the world and to be part of the human resources community. I think AI is um, absolutely transforming and will continue to transform pretty much everything we do. So if you think about the research that has just been shared, people are demanding more out of HR, whether it's employees, whether it's managers, people are really looking for that that help to put together career paths, to find more diverse candidates, um, to be able to do things in a more cost-efficient manner. And if you look at how AI is transforming things like, obviously, performance enablement, getting smarter, giving managers more nudges, helping them uh, take some of the guesswork out, some of the administrative work out of uh, some of these processes that they have to do. Um, but I think one of the areas that is pretty exciting is around the talent marketplace. So I think we're gonna move from um, being able to, to find candidates in a very different way. Um, certainly we'll be able to find them in places that we never could before through this powerful technology, be able to bring them into the workplace um, in a much more unbiased way, uh, focus less on skills, more on attributes, which we'll be able to measure through AI which will, uh, again, enable much higher performance. You can always teach somebody a skill, but you can't really teach them an attribute. So it's gonna really start to transform lots of different ways we think about our, our talent in general and how we get the best out of people and how they have the absolute best experience. So I think from an HR perspective, it's less to be fearful of and really more to lean into. I think it will improve what we do I don't think it's gonna take the human touch out of it. People are still gonna demand that connection, but I think it's gonna allow, and, and I think as, as great as AI is, there's, there's a baseline of information. We're still gonna need that human creativity and innovation that goes along with continuing to progress the agenda of your company. So I think it's a very exciting time. I think there's gonna be lots and lots of um, opportunities for all of us. I would say embrace it learn more about it. Um, uh, Josh Burson just put out a really great white paper on AI and, and the implications around HR, not to be afraid of it, but really to try to understand it and, um, and look for applications that are gonna give you much more holistic solutions um, versus point solutions. I mean, we're finally kind of getting there with the end-to-end -end employee journey as a community. And, and a lot of it is gonna rest on AI. That's great. And I yeah, so I would say you sound like you're on the optimistic side for sure. Absolutely. Uh, which is fantastic. I, I like that side of it versus the doom and gloom. And, you know, I think Andrew and Ben, I'd love to get your thoughts too. And, you know, I think to, to recap a you know, comment by Susan there, she's talking about the talent marketplace. And I know there's even projections out there of like mass, you know, jobs going away. And I, I don't think that's what I heard from Susan. I actually heard that you know that these advanced technologies can actually help in decision decision planning around the workforce and repackaging of skills, reuse of people in new and more important jobs than maybe the ones they've been doing and such. And I mean, I think I think that I'm paraphrasing, but I think that's kind of where you're going on the optimistic side. I mean, how do you how do you both feel about this? Yeah, Andrew, you want to start? Uh, 
Yeah, I'll, I'll start. You know, I, I, I agree. I'm, I'm very optimistic and excited about the changes that are going to come, especially from the HR standpoint, because this is going to allow us to really add more value than I think we've ever in the past, just because there's, there's going to be new opportunities. Um, but the one thing I would say is, you know, I've talked to a lot of employees and I see, you know, we have those early adopters that are very excited for it. You know, they're already thinking of ways that they're going to implement AI into their roles, their departments to add more value. But then there's, you know, these employees that have um, some FUD, some fear, uncertainty, and doubt of what this means to them. And I think it's it's crucial, especially in, in HR, to start having these conversations to start eliminate some of that fear so we can start embracing some of the values that come from it. Um, but I think where I'm most excited from a, an HR standpoint is some of the things that Susan talked about in, you know, analytics. I think, you know, there are so many opportunities to make data-driven decisions and this, you know, an AI is going to be something to really help us, you know, take that next level, especially in HR. Excellent. I'm totally with you on that one. So the way that I put it, Andrew, and to everybody else that are listening in for a second, think about this. I think about what drew me into HR personally. I think about what made me excited about it. And it wasn't right going through and reconciling benefit statements or checking payroll exceptions or any number of other things we do that just make you want to pull your hair out. It was things like really coaching our leaders to be great leaders. It was about developing a pipeline of talent so that we didn't get caught flat-footed next time someone decided to leave uh, arbitrarily. Right? All those kind of things excited me about getting into HR in the first place. And what's thrilling about AI is it's going to take some of those other things off our plate, off of our to-do list that we probably don't love that much anyway, that make us feel a little bit robotic and impersonal. And let us spend more time and encourage us to spend more time in those areas. And we're actually seeing that in our data. I know it's been a kind of a, the party line for a long time or the, the the saying in the market for a long time, oh, AI is going to let us do more strategic stuff. People throw that around. I'm an optimist, but also a little skeptical sometimes. So we've actually done research on that to understand how employers that are transitioning to using some of these tools, how are your people then spending their time? Is it, okay, great, we need to get rid of some headcount? Or no, they're going to spend that time developing deeper relationships, building greater trust, really focusing on proving our impact back to the business. So that those things sort of really thrill me. And that's the focus. That's the reason I wrote the book um, in the first place is because I wanted to encourage and educate HR leaders out there on how these tools can help us to really realize that vision we have. One thing I'll echo off of, or uh, kind of bounce off of Susan, um, Susan's comments earlier, sorry, uh, around talent marketplaces is we actually did some research on this and we found that employees, when you give them a choice for that first initial career exploration, they actually prefer some sort of self-service technology and AI enabled tool where they can explore, experiment, test, look at what career paths are possibly out there for them before they talk to a manager. 80% of them prefer that computer version, right? An online version that they can they can play with versus talking to a manager because we all know once you have that discussion, some managers are gonna close upon you. That's gonna sour the relationship, cause other issues. So there's a, a lot of interest from the employee side for that. The other thing, the thing that I'll close with is when you look at automation, you look at the history of it, mechanical automation, right? When we were farming and agriculture and all that stuff to digital automation today, all these types of automation, when that wave comes by, the work that's left behind is more human focused than the work that was there before. It strips away some of those things that are repetitive, that are routine, that are over and over and over and helps us focus on those things that it leaves behind, which are a little more human oriented, things like compassion, things like curiosity, those skills that humans have, those attributes, Susan, right, that humans have that are much harder to teach an algorithm, almost impossible in some cases to teach a system to do those things the way that humans naturally do that kind of stuff. And so that's my, my encouragement there as all the research we're seeing, all the data we're seeing, the experiments we've done, there's a lot of hope and excitement around this. And it's not just Pollyanna, let's hold hands and sing, but we're actually seeing in the data employers transitioning to this and seeing better outcomes for their people. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and I'm gonna take a question from a DT from the audience here, um, you know, because I think it ties back in part partially to Andrew, your comment about the fear and uncertainty around AI. Her question is, are there any recommendations for how we can gauge employee sentiment around AI? What best practices around surveys or focus groups are, are we are you you know kind of hearing about or seeing out there to, to date? But how do you how do you kind of get that feeling of where the employees are at on the spectrum with it? 
Well, I'll, I'll chime in there, John. Um, I, I believe that every um, company should have a listening strategy, and that should just be part of the portfolio of what you offer up every year as part of um, how you're going to stay close to the employee sentiment. And so there's so many tools out there. There's pulse surveys, there's annual surveys, there's real-time surveys, but this idea of really being able to capture your, your MPS score at any time um, will give you incredible information real time. And I think through the use of AI, actually more actionable feedback or that you can actually do something with. So I think you can pulse your people, you can build this into your listening strategy um, as a way of framing and communicating where you're trying to go with this and what some of those you know, potential benefits might be. And you can really bring people into the conversation and ask them, you know, if we were to apply some of these things a little bit more robustly around certain systems, where would, where would the most value be for you as an end user, as a manager, as a middle manager, as an employee? So I think there's ways to invite people in and hopefully the more conversation you have, the more transparent you are, like you're not trying to do something to people, you're trying to invite them into the conversation and collectively get smarter and collectively provide a much better employee experience. I'm going to ask, ask one more question on the AI front from the audience, and we'll have to go. To, we'll go to the next question uh, that we were planning. Um, but Scott Thorne uh, asked the question: If it, how, if any, would AI influence the decision-making process in succession management, particularly with the C-suite? And I think it's interesting because I think that's often managed on a. Uh, you could tell me, Susan, is it often managed on a spreadsheet, or am I <laughs> am I making yes. that up? Yes, a very yeah. maybe a not updated spreadsheet. <laughs> um, well, so. and, there's, and there's probably other metrics that would come out, um, and yeah. I don't I don't want to dominate this, but things like um, you know O and A, you know your organizational network analysis, where you really could begin to measure that kind of information about relationships. So if you're thinking about succession planning and you're thinking about who the influencers influencers are in your company, who are those multipliers? There's all sorts of ways and indications that are out there that we haven't really been able to very elegantly and very efficiently um, gather, if you will, and analyze. And so, you know, if, if that were available, you could have such a different conversation with your, you know, leadership team around, you know, your candidate pool. And so these conversations don't really exist today. They're very biased. They're very limited in terms of how much data any of us really has. Um, you don't really know. You're kind of guessing a lot of things and you're hoping for the best. But then you start to look at your success rate and your, you know, how many people have left and your turnover and a lot of other things. It's kind of a crapshoot. So it's it's really important to, I, I think, you know, kind of embrace this for, for all. You, you have so many applications. That's why I'm so excited about it. Um, so many applications to to, to get it right. Um, and, and build that trust. And that's why HR doesn't have a lot of trust because you're kind of flying blind a lot of the time. And people look at those decisions and say, geez, that's an oddball decision, you know, from their vantage point. So I think there's um, lots of opportunities. Yep, I agree. Okay, well, so we're gonna go on to the next question and I'm gonna throw this one towards Ben and Andrew, but this is about this, this notion of fairness and wanting, you know, employees wanting in return from their employer what they give in terms of you know the energy and effort it takes to do their jobs and they want that in return and um, it just seems like employers there's such a minority of employers that get the whole package right you know career growth culture you know giving people autonomy meaningful work no matter how hard hr seems to try and so the first question ben and andrew you know have we progressed on this spectrum at all, or is it still just a, a, a really rarity that you see a company that really has hit all of these, these variables very effectively? I'll start off on this one. I really see a divide. There are companies, and some of you may be listening in, you represent one of these companies that really is leaning in on this front, is thinking about these pieces and how they come together and how to serve your employees well. Are you really focusing on those things? And that is at the forefront of every decision that it can be. And those employers are seeing the benefits there. They're seeing the results. They're seeing the impacts, like I mentioned earlier. Um, there are others that, like, I'm not sure how to start, or it seems like such a big problem, or it's always been an issue, and it will always be an issue. We've kind of lost hope that there's a chance to actually solve for that. And what I'll say is, 
there are so many different things we can do around this, different ways we, you can start. It's not about saying, okay, I want you to snap your fingers and tackle these 17 parts of how we manage and support talent, and it's all going to be great because all of us know that that's not possible to do that. You can't have all those focus areas because it will fall apart. But instead say, okay, I want to really improve this one thing. Right now we're going to start with getting managers supported and bought in and really enabling their people. Or we're going to focus on belonging of our employees and making sure they feel accepted, respected, and appreciated when it comes to work. Because what we see in our research is when someone says they feel accepted, respected, and appreciated when it comes to their job, they're five times more likely to tell everybody else they know about how great your company is to work for. Right? When all of us are – when many companies were struggling with recruiting issues in the last year or two. Right? That's the thing I was telling them is it's not just about posting more jobs or making sure recruiters are out there on every you know channel, but are you making sure that every one of your people are so thrilled with working there? They are glad to tell others about it. One other thing that ties into this is we talked about career mobility in the conversation today. So one of the things that stands out to me is the research shows that when you make opportunities visible to your people, they are twice as interested in pursuing those pretty straightforward make them visible they're twice interested in looking at and pursuing those opportunities so if we can start thinking about okay how do we get them bought in how do we make sure that everyone has the opportunity to look at other things inside the business and chime in and develop themselves and grow and be successful long term help them cast a vision for what it looks like being successful at your company because if we don't do that if we don't have our managers do that or they don't know how to when the recruiter calls from the competition and says, hey, let me tell you about this great opportunity, they don't have anything in their head to compete with that because we haven't helped to paint that picture. So that's the, the big focus here is if we want to do that, it's absolutely possible. Employers, are, Some employers are doing it really well right now. But if you're one of those that feels like you're a little bit behind, there's the simplest and easiest piece of advice is pick one of those areas, really focus on being great at that and build from there. And, and, and Andrew, I mean, you, you are a practitioner in the middle of all this, right? And so maybe yeah. what, what are your thoughts on, on those needle movers and which ones you, you know, you pursue? Yeah, you know, I think uh, when Ben was talking about, you know, those who may have lost faith, I will say I was one of those individuals, you know, I'd been in HR for a long time and the performance management never really uh, engaged me, got me all excited, you know, to come into work. And over the last couple of years, we have really hit a stride. When we first moved to BetterWorks, um, I really thought the goal setting and the continuous goal setting, the more agile approach was really going to be the thing that moved the needle for us. But uh, and it has helped in the transparency. So many good things came from it. But the, the conversation piece has been the, the biggest needle mover for us. As Mel Michelle was talking about, the managers need help. They're busy. They don't have time to go study, you know, what questions should I be asking? How do I really, you know, help with this fair deal when it comes to employees? But conversations have allowed us to give, you know, the playbook to these managers to allow them to have meaningful conversations, you know, more frequent conversations. Uh, so when employers are walking out of there, they feel like they do have, and they know they had a, a fair deal. Um, and and the evolution for us is we have changed the way we do conversations dramatically. We are now to a point, um, you know, we do quarterly ENPS um, surveys with our staff and we take themes from there and we will incorporate that into our conversation. So if we're seeing themes around work-life harmony being, you know, out of balance, you know, we will put questions in there to help engage the managers, help them guide them to those. Um, and then we have some other questions uh, that we do twice a year. Um, you know, and I'm going to read these off because they have changed our entire culture. So we asked the employees to answer these going into these conversations. If you could change one thing in your role, allowing you to excel more, what would it be? How would you like to grow in this organization? Do you feel a sense of purpose? What do you need from your manager to do your best work? What are we currently not doing as a company slash department that we should be? And do you have an opportunity to do what you do best every day? And if no, explain why. And, you know, those questions twice a year, they, they have changed the culture uh, and they have changed the outlook from a man, uh, an employee standpoint when it comes to uh, performance management. So, yes, absolutely. BetterWorks has, has been a huge help with this. Oh, I was love hearing that. <laughs> I'm going to transition us to the next question here because we there was so much that Michelle brought up earlier about manager effectiveness and the pressure they're under. And I think we just all fundamentally believe if you get this wrong, you, you don't get past go. So, you know, we you know, we um, um, we know the stats around, you know, employees quit their job, number one, because of bad managers. 
um, according to research. So let's let's talk about how the managers caught in the middle here. What is your read on the state of managers in the workplace today? Um, and are companies really responsible uh, for this kind of negligence? Um, as, as we seem to all be pointing our fingers to our research says it, a lot of research points it out. So I'll go with um, actually whoever wants to answer that question. I'll, I'll just say a couple quick things. I, I think managers are pretty burned out. <laughs> Um, they're being asked to do an awful lot. Um, and, you know, they are asked, especially first line, second level managers to, to still maintain all of the, you know, technical work that they had been doing, um, contributing as an individual contributor, but also contributing as a, a people manager. And this is where I do think HR technology, and as we just discussed, having a playbook, having um, some, you know, tips and tricks and frameworks and technology to help support them at scale is becoming increasingly important. Um, I would agree there's been an underinvestment invest, um, in basic training for managers. Um, when you were on a management track, you would be expected to go through a certain amount of training and you would have a lot of in-person kinds of things or you would travel. And those things just aren't scalable any longer or affordable in a lot of environments, a lot of companies. So I think having these alternative ways of building that confidence for the managers is um, absolutely critical to having a good employee manager experience. But that's where I do believe um, some sort of a uh, solution, technology solution is, is probably the only way to, to really scale that and um, to, to help these poor managers who are expected sort of by osmosis to be, to be effective in their job. And um, anyway, that's all I'll say about it. I, I just think there's that, um, you know, I look at, you know, the playbooks and things that BetterWorks does and many other companies. I, I just think it's, it's really um, the shift that we're seeing that's, that's positive. And, and Andrew, you're on the front line there, and you you, and you already referenced that one of the needle movers for you, you and Best Western is with the Converse, introducing the conversations. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about the manager and how you're seeing this play out? Yeah, um, you know, I think Susan made a bunch of really good points. We have to we got to coach our coaches more than ever, um, but we have to make it as easy as possible for them. They, you know. Uh, the managers are, are close to burnt out, if not burnt out. They're juggling so many different, you know, balls in the air at one time. So, you know, having playbooks, guidebooks, um, toolboxes, whatever you want to say for them, however you make it easy for them to be successful at their job, like that's where we need to be looking. And that's where conversations really come into play for us. Sometimes, you know, th they need help with understanding what questions should I be asking. And, um, you know, conversations allow us to do that is to just kind of give them the guidebook and say, hey, you know, go have these conversations. It's gonna spearhead into a bunch of really good conversations, but let us help you get it started. Um, so it's just making things easy for them where we can. Great, great. Um, I wanna take another audience question. We're gonna go a little backwards into the AI topic really quick. Um, and uh, because I think we have, it's a really important one. Becky, um, you asked the question, are there any concerns that AI could result in discrimination when used in applicant tracking systems? Uh, ben, I think you've, you've done a lot of thinking on AI. Can you, can you answer that one for her? And Becky, sorry I didn't get it to it when we were up in the AI section, but we saw it and we wanted to make sure we got back to it. Sure, really quickly, uh, Becky, good question. And absolutely, it's always a possibility. I'll tell you that the the, the uh, companies that are building the technologies now are very cognizant of that and they're very careful about that. The thing that I'm much more concerned about is we all the news typically that's in the headlines around AI being biased, it typically be is because we have trained it on a biased data set. So if we have a bunch of managers who only hire men and we train the algorithm on that and we say, this is what a great employee looks like, well, that ATS or that recruiting system, whatever one we're using is gonna say, oh, well, men are the best, let's deprioritize women. And that's the problem overall. The good thing about this is you can actually look under the hood of these things and see what triggers it to make that decision, make that recommendation. We can't see those triggers for our managers who find some way to, you know, skirt the issue, skirt the system, try to find a way to, to say no to some candidate that they should say yes to. And so the, the benefit of an AI system is that we at least have the ability to audit that and see where that decision comes from. You can't, the black box of the human mind is closed off for us there. So that's my best recommendation on that. 
Yeah, and that's a great point. And we're, 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 at BetterWorks, we're really taking a principled approach that says, you know, if you can't explain the answer via AI, then you probably have to be careful to even give the answer, right? And, and yes. that's the only way you're going to build trust in these kinds of data sets coming back at you and information. Um, while you're here, Ben, I'm going I'm to go to the next question we had kind of planned into this. And, you know, it goes back to the research, the question of trust, this big trust deficit out there between employees and 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 their in the company and their and their in hr very specifically which which without trust i don't think any of us think we're going to be very successful what can a company do to get back on course and specifically you know it, you know we saw that the right performance management approach can can help but if you can comment on the getting back on track that would be great when it comes to trust I was, at an, I was at an event recently speaking, and I asked the question of a, of a group of HR leaders in the audience. I said, okay, who in here thinks that an employee, a brand new employee we just hired, how many of you think this person needs to earn their manager's trust? And like three-fourths of the people raised their hand. And I said, well, that's really strange because those people think they've already earned our trust by getting through this entire hiring process and us selecting them. They think that we're all going to extend them trust right off the bat, not that they have to earn it from us. And so that's one thing I would encourage us to, to stop and think about is if you are one of those, if you have a bunch of managers that say they've got to earn it, like, then you just pick them because you trust them to do their best job. And we need to think about the, the signals we're sending there. And I know one of the questions earlier was around having the right incentives to, to roar the right behaviors. We're trying to get out of these leaders because you may have people that say, oh, we believe that, but then they're incentivizing their own behaviors. So if we want to rebuild trust, we have to be willing to extend it first. And the easiest person to extend it to is someone who's gone through all of those hoops we make them jump through, all those backflips and everything else to be able to come on board with our company. Let's extend, extend a little bit of grace, a little bit of trust, and expect the best from them and move forward accordingly instead of saying, okay, now, now they've got to try to start earning this. Now they've got to start trying to prove themselves. That's one of the big things that came out in our new research on performance is that we see a significant number of employees saying that performance is about trying to come together and say, I'm trying to prove that I'm worth it instead of saying, how can I improve what I'm doing over the coming, the coming, you know, few months next year, so on. So if there's an encouragement there on the, on the trust piece, because that's a, once it's burned, it's hard rebuilt. Everybody knows that in our personal relationships, our work relationships, yeah. but yeah. The, the first place to start is extending it, extend some grace, extend some trust. It's hard to go wrong that way. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and, and, and Susan or, or Andrew, do you have anything to add there? I mean, what, you know, a well, lot of companies come from the distrust. You know, they're, they're trying to rebuild from it. Do you have anything to add specifically to that point? Well, kind of going back to what Ben said, it, and it's kind of a, it's kind of the flip. You know, um, your, your job is to have your employees want to trust you. <laughs> so it's really not about you trusting them when they're coming in. It's you have to earn their trust. You, and you do that by you know, wanting them to want to trust you and through your actions. And it's a lot of doing what you said you're gonna do. So the typical uh, HR landing page, it's about you know, our, our culture, our values, career paths. And somebody comes inside of a company and if there's no there there, trust is going to begin to erode. So it's a lot about you know, old fashioned principles, doing what you said you were gonna do, that your word matters, that you have your employees back. Uh, you're, you're taking steps every day to make them want to trust you. And I think that's a very different way of thinking about trust. Um, to Ben's earlier point, it's kind of like, okay, now prove it to me. I've hired you, now prove it to me. And that is a really backwards, to me, mindset. I'm gonna ask one more audience question. I think that's gonna be probably all we have time for, but Joy asked this great question. She, she asked the question that, um, you know, she, the biggest problem she's had in terms of kind of doing these more progressive, you know, rollouts of, perform, you know, more performance enablement approach or performance moving away from traditional performance management is how do you get people excited about it within the company? Um, so it's kind of building on the trust stop and going on to the positive of, of this question of excitement. She, she says that, you know, in, in, her, in her world, line managers are often the most difficult to persuade, especially she gives the example of engineers being stubborn to adapt and if you adopt and I assume the, the the implication there is if you're not getting the line manager, you're not getting the employees to get excited to want to, to try these things. Maybe, maybe Andrew, you start because you're really on that front line right now. You know, do you, do you see resistance ever? Do you see ways of exciting people um, to, to adapt and change to new processes like this? 
Yeah, you know, I think there's always going to be resistance. Anytime there's something, uh, you know, if there's change, there, there's going to be people who don't want to change. Um, you know, what really helped us was uh, really focusing on the outcome and, you know, these conversations with the manager, you know, the, the whiff them, what's in it for me? Why would we want to change? And we spent a lot of time building foundation uh, of you know, the benefits that would come in their world, that would come to the business side, you know, with these types of changes. But then also, how are we going to support them through these changes? You know, I don't think it's uh, in a situation we're going to just throw them into the deep end, but we talk about, like, here are the things that we will do to help this be successful. This is how you are an active participant in it. We collected their feedback to help with questions. They were a part of the solution. Um, but I don't think there's any magic answer to this one. It, it is going to be a challenge. Um, you know, once the results start coming, you know, that's when you'll start seeing that wave of people jumping on board. Um, but everyone wants to add value and, you know, what we were doing before, you know, I, some could argue it was, was it really adding value? So I think, it, you know, it, it, it allowed people to open up and say, hey, is there a different way to do this? And slowly started getting people on board. Um, Joy, I would also suggest putting together, if, if you are looking at implementing something new, uh, putting together a group of maybe 10 to 15 people that are influencers in your company and even that curmudgeon, that naysayer, put them on, put them on the committee and, um, you know, really get input and, and have, you know, global representation, get lots of good, different points of view, have a nice diverse set of uh, opinions and people to help shape that. And you start getting momentum that way, you get more involvement. So it's not just an HR thing, but it's really a we thing that everybody's involved in. The other thing you can do, you can always market things very differently. You don't have to call it, we're gonna reinvent performance reviews. You know, you can make it into something um, much, much more attractive like conversation days or a performance exchange or whatever works for your culture and your company. And you could have a campaign around it. You could involve people in naming it and getting people excited about it. So a little bit of marketing, a little bit of bringing people into the fold, you know, recognizing those people who are taking time to work on a company-wide project, getting your CEO involved. Um, you know, there's just some, um, you know, easy, simple ways to do it where you really get that camaraderie. And, and in my opinion, nothing unites people more than a common purpose, working on a project together. Those are bonds that people are gonna, gonna make cross, uh, cross-functional bonds, cross-company. And um, that's when people, I, I, in my experience, have gotten really excited about being involved in these projects. And then they become coveted. They become kind of the thing that people want to get involved in and do. So, um, yeah. Great. And I'm going to get completely busted because Alex wants to come on and say it's over. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask one question from the audience that I've been, I've been itching to ask. I'm going to give Ben one shot. at a, a, Ben, I really get busted if you go past 45 seconds. So um, does the panel foresee companies needing to create an AI department, much like we have an IT department today? That was Deborah. Um, can you answer that quickly? And then we're going to have quickly. to wrap up. There, I'm seeing organizations that do have some larger enterprises that do have a head of AI that is in charge of thinking about that application across multiple areas of the business and trying to keep a unified sort of governance to that. That said, HR leaders that are really forward thinking are going to be thinking already about how this fits in. And if you have a little bit of a lean towards analytics or lean towards right, HR technology, I'm seeing some of those leaders start to adopt that into their titles, into their responsibilities, and really take a leading role in that instead of waiting for someone else to tell them like we have for many years with the finance IT telling us what to do or dictating things. They're saying, I'm going to take a leading role in this and participate in the solution. Boy, that was perfect, and I'm going to get busted, but not as bad because you were quick there, too. So, again, I want to thank all three of you for participating. I think it was an incredible conversation. Um, and, and everybody out there, please fill out the survey. Give us feedback. We adapt and change this format based on what you tell us. I think we definitely are going to have to do an AI webinar very soon because there were so many questions on that. But I hope I got to as many as possible of your questions. Um, thank you. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. And I just wanted to uh, also say stay tuned for details on our next webinar you'll see on screen here. Uh, in our People Fundamentals series, we've got Polly Labar on August 24th, and those invites will be coming soon. Uh, as John mentioned, we do love uh, folks to uh, fill out our feedback survey that's inside of the platform. So uh, please.
please uh, please do fill that out. And I'd like to, on behalf of BetterWorks, thank Ben, Susan, and Andrew, and all of our speakers today for a wonderful webinar. Thank you so much, and have a great rest of your day.